give it one more minute and then I will start. I guess we're all interested in the topic of storytelling and giving speeches, huh? That's what it sounds like. Yeah, great. So about four years ago, I stood on a stage in Austin at the Nordic API conference and it was my first ever technical talk. Now, when I got on stage, I was confident. I was fine. I was like, I got this, I'm gonna do this, you know? I was born for this. And I make the crowd laugh in the first few minutes, we're doing well. And, you know, I'm engaging with them, kind of like warming up to them. And after a few minutes, I start to kind of stumble on my words and mumble and forget things I wanted to say. And it's this like awkward next 15 minutes as I'm trying to just get to the end of my talk and my notes, I hadn't written them well and my and like switching from the code to my slides and, you know, nothing goes as it was supposed to go. And the worst part is that at the end, when they're doing the question and answers part, someone asked me the question where the answer to her question should have been literally my entire talk, which means that I had completely neglected to tell them what I was supposed to be telling them. So what happened here? What happened in that moment where I was like, okay, I'm not that nervous, where usually we're pretty nervous when we get on stage, but I wasn't so nervous and I was okay with the audience, but then everything went downhill. Now, before I can answer that, I'm going to tell you how I even got to this stage. So I was born in Miami uh, to religious Orthodox parents who gave me a computer when I was pretty young and I fell in love with it. And then at the age of 14, they decided that it was inappropriate for me to have internet in my bedroom. Makes sense, right? First, first daughter, teenage daughter, shouldn't be up all night talking to boys or I don't know what, right? So my dad firewalls my internet and, uh, and I, he like did something that made me not be able to access the internet. And one night, like everyone's asleep and I need internet access. So I try to figure out how to like make it happen. And eventually I click something and suddenly I've got browser access and my aim is up and I'm talking to my friends and it's the middle of the night and I stay up all night just like, ah, we can talk about nothing for hours and nobody knows. Anyway, this goes on for a few months. And one day my dad walks into my room and the volume's on. And he's like, what is that sound? And I'm like, uh, iTunes. And he realizes what's been going on. And he gets so upset that he just slices my internet cable. So I spend the next few days at the library computer trying to figure out how I'm putting this cable back together. I go to the electronics store, the Radio Shack down the block. And I pick up one of those little plastic pieces. I borrow a crimpy thingy. It's like a stapler for cables. Uh, from the IT guy at my elementary school. <laughs> and I figure out online which order the mini wires inside the cable need to go in. And I put this cable back together and I plug it into my computer. And I am now surfing the web, my AIM, all night long and nobody knows. Fast forward a couple months, same thing happens. My dad's like, I am suspicious of the amount of time that you are spending in your bedroom. Are you connected to the internet? And he pulls, you know, the computer, the massive computer out of the little space in my desk. And he looks behind and lo and behold, this blue cable is plugged in. And this time he's so upset that he unplugs everything, places my computer on his shoulders and walks out of my room. And I'm grounded for two weeks. Two weeks later, we now have Wi-Fi. And there's no LAN access in our house. <laughs> And now it's game on. And I spend like I download um, Linux so that I can try to like hack the Wi Fi because at the time you could maybe do it. The problem is this requires 40 hours and I have to go to school. And I try all sorts of different things. I order on eBay like one of those Wi Fi adapters because I've got like an old school PC. And I try to get the neighbor's Wi Fi. And then I put a key logger on all the computers in our house and reset the router on a night where there's a hurricane because we're in Miami. So obviously there's a hurricane. Figure out that the password is Jerusalem one. And every time my dad changes it, he increments the number by one. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> a few months later, I'm like old enough. And my dad's like, okay, happy birthday. Here's an iPod touch. Here's the Wi-Fi password. You win. 
go do something useful with your life. And of course, in my college interview, they're like, oh, you like computers, you're going to study computer science. And I become a computer science slash design major and a programmer for a couple of years until I realize that I don't want to do this. And I find the world of developer relations and I love writing documentation and I love giving speeches and I love teaching things. And this all brings us back to my first talk at the Austin Nordic Conference. Today, I am a developer relations person at Vonage based in the Israel headquarters. Vonage is all about SMS, video, uh, audio APIs, and it's all about communication. And that's why we're here today talking about how to enhance communication. I was also asked to tell you that we have an open Ruby position. So if you're interested, I'll post that in the Discord after. I know I'm gonna forget to say it at the end, which is why I'm saying it now. Cool. Now, why did I just tell you all of this? The reason is because when you are presenting to an audience, when you are taking an hour and a half of the audience's time, you have two jobs. The first one is to connect with the audience. Now, what we think that we're supposed to be doing is getting on a stage and saying, hi, I'm Arital, I'm from Miami. Um, I, uh, I, I am a Java developer, I'm a Python developer today, I'm a developer advocate. I, um, I love dogs, I don't really love cats, and I also really like Photoshop and you know a bunch of other facts about me. And the problem is that this doesn't really get the audience to engage with us. This doesn't really get the audience to like, connect with us and relate to us because we're just giving them a bunch of facts. But what about a story? That's what we're here, right? We're, we're, we're trying to tell a story. And the reason we want to tell a story is because A, it makes people want to listen. Our brains are just wired to listen to stories. Our brains are wired to, you know, for this thing that we've been getting for so many years, we it's like one of the oldest things that we remember from when we were a kid. Hopefully you were t being told stories as a little kid. And our brain just wired to listen to something that has a beginning, a middle and end, especially if you can build up some suspense. And I like to take it a little further than this. I compare everything to food. I'm sorry, this will come up time and time again in our workshop today. But imagine that instead of giving a talk at a conference or a meetup, you actually had to make someone dinner. Okay, I'm sure a bunch of you have made people dinner. Now you can take the easy way out and make some chicken breast and white rice, which I don't mind at all, but you know, assuming people are not a vegan, they're not vegans, they would eat it, they'd be fine, they wouldn't be hungry, right? Like they'd make it to their next meal with a little bit of carbs and protein, it'd be fine. But would they remember the dinner you made them? Would they enjoy it? Would they ever speak about it again? Like, well, have they had a memorable experience with your chicken and rice? Probably not because you gave them the bare minimum. So what we wanna speak about here today is how to give them, you know, the cocktail at the beginning or the glass of wine, if that's your kind of thing, with the appetizer salad and the flavors and maybe the chicken thigh and not the chicken breast because it just has so much more flavor, you know, and a nice dessert to wrap up that entire experience, like, or a nice size sandwich, which is what I like to call it. A good beginning, a good end. You've got like these two pieces of bread and all the good stuff, like in a nice order in the middle, like put together in a nice package that people could take home and remember and learn from and use in their daily life. And that is what your job is when you get on stage. The other one is to provide value. And that was exactly where I went wrong in Austin. I had the basic idea of what I wanted to teach, and I'll come back to that soon. The basic idea of what I wanted to teach, you know. I, my, I had just started at this company. I went up to the developers. I was like, hey guys, like, you know, what cool thing are you doing that I could speak about at this API conference? Someone's like, oh, we do this really cool X, Y, and Z. You know, we, we automatically generate our client libraries. Like, why don't you speak about that? And I'm just like, okay. And I go to this conference and I'm like information, 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 information. But I didn't really know what value I wanted to give to my audience. I had no idea like, who is my audience that they would want to receive this knowledge? How can I give it to them in a way that is easy for them to consume? What is the one thing that I want them to remember? And, and when you're nervous and when you're up there and you don't have your one specific focus and your one specific goal, it's very easy to get distracted, to get nervous, to forget things. You look at that person who's on their phone and you're in your head, you're doing like the, 
they're on their phone. I'm not interesting. Like, what was I going to say next? Should I say the thing that I was going to say next? Did I just say that thing wrong? Like, uh, everything's messed up and you're in that loop now and you've got 10 more minutes to your talk and you forget everything that you wanted to say. And then at the end, they ask you the question to which the answer is everything you were supposed to say and you realize that you terribly messed up. So today we're going to focus. Are you on a treadmill, Ariel? Okay. Cool. Yes, That's I am. Is it, I can I can uh, stop or turn off my no, video it's if it's okay. distracting. I just, I, it, it, I didn't want to I didn't want to stop myself in the middle of talking, but, but I was very curious the whole time. I appreciate this. I have not worked out in a week, so I, I really appreciate this. Um, I want to point out but, I'm at my desk also. It's I'm not like you know on a treadmill. Just I'm it's a yeah, treadmill. Yeah, I got desk, it. You're so. one of those people. I got that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Welcome. Um, <laughs> so, so what we're going to mostly focus on today, um, is these two things I just meant. We're going to, we're going to talk about connecting and we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about introductions and we're going to talk about how to really understand what that value that you need to give is and turn it into a talk, into a sandwich that you could present to your audience. Now we don't have a lot of time and we have quite a bunch of people in this group, um, but what I would like to begin with is um, maybe a short introduction segment. Here's how we're going to do this. What I would like is three volunteers, okay, who you can raise your hand in a second, who would want to tell us a one minute story about themselves. So a story, like I said, it's not a series of facts. It's a cute story or a, a sad story. I don't care. Uh, a silly story um, about yourself that again, isn't like a series of facts. It has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end, kind of like my story about when I was a kid and this is how I got into the internet and computers and ended up in computer science. And the more details you can squeeze into the story about yourself to help us get to know you, the better. But you have one minute. Now the rest of you, if you have an interesting story that you wanna say in two sentences, feel free to put it um, in the channel. You all have access to the channel, correct? Yes, cool. So let me just make sure I'm in there. You all have access to, oh, I have so many channels in this. I'll find it eventually. Um, so <laughs> uh, I guess we can also put in the chat here, but I'm supposed to keep everything over there. I don't even think we have a chat here. So um, would anyone like to volunteer to tell us a one minute story about themselves? Um, something interesting that happened, something inspiring, something you learned today, you learned this week. If you want to tell us a cow joke, go for it. But we want to hear more about you. And I do believe you have access to raise your hand. And I do believe that it jumps up to the top if you do so, right? Cool. I don't know how to do this. So I just, I'll just say that I could volunteer. Okay, the problem is that I don't know who just spoke. It's Maciej Rosa, and he should, he may see me, but I don't know how to. Um, ah, there we go. Okay, we can hear you. You are not in my home screen, but let's hear your one minute story. Let me start my timer. It's okay. I'll pay attention to it. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so it was a couple of years ago. I was a young developer, believing that I'm almost a senior developer. That wasn't true back then, uh, but uh, I was in this uh, in this strange state, and I really thought that speaking at a tech conference is awesome, and only the best of the best can speak at a conference, and. Um, it's not for me. And then I saw a great conference. I think it was Nordic Ruby or something like this. It was awesome. It was in the spa outside of the city. It was very informal. Uh, those people were sharing time between talks so, and sauna and they were uh, wearing those informal, uh, I don't know how it's, it's dressing robes. Uh, it's, it's called in English. And I thought, wow, it's great but it's, it's so expensive, I'll never afford this. Uh, and I thought um, I have to become a speaker to, to get there. And I thought it's impossible. And then uh, step by step, 
talking in, in, in meetups, then talking in an international concert and a conference and failing there. Uh, I get to speaking and big conferences. And now I realize it's not impossible and it's definitely not for the best of the best. It's just doable. Um, I'm over time. Thank you for following the time. I really appreciate you saying that because one of, yes, thank you. Uh, Robson, we're coming to you in a second. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you saying that because one of the things that I like to tell people pretty often is that it's not, public speaking is not something you're born with. I mean, sometimes, you know, some people are charming and, and that's natural, but getting to a point that you're speaking on a stage and you sound good speaking on a stage and you're confident, it's just a skill. It's like a, it's, it's, an, it's something you have to practice. It's like a muscle that we just have to keep working on like anything else. You know, I'm not born with biceps or abs. I, you know, go to the gym quite frequently and it's the same thing here. And it's just something that we have to wrap our mind around. Like you don't get from A to Z in two seconds, just like you can't build up massive muscles in two seconds. All of these things require small steps and a way of thinking and a way of training and a way of practicing to get us to that point. So thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate it. Uh, Robson, you're up. Let's hear your one minute. Right. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, hello. All right, so uh, this is not really a Rails related story. It's more like a family story when I first learned how to use computers. So my dad learned how to use a computer back in the 90s. And the thing is that he's right-handed, but his teacher was left-handed. So he, was, he thought all the time that, oh, I should probably use the mouse with my left hand instead of my dominant, my right, my right hand. And then he taught my mom how to use a computer. And my mom is also right-handed. And she started using the mouse with, the le with her left hand. And my mom taught me, and I'm also right-handed, and I started using, I use the mouse all the time with my left hand. So now we have an entire generation of right-handed people that only can use the computer using their left hand. And I intend to pass this uh, kind of trait to my kids if possible, but if not, that's okay as well. <laughs> that's my little story. I really like that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we learned from the story that you have uh, your you have a lineage of computer lovers in your family. That was great. I like that a lot. Um, as so, I I'm a little bit jumping ahead right now. But for example, if you wanted to give a talk about something that we do something that we do that we don't really think about we just take it for granted and it's something we do all the time some habit that we have be it in technology or not in technology but likely in technology because that's what we're here for today um you could tell that story as an introduction to we just do things without really questioning why we're doing them or how we're doing them we're really technically i mean i don't know is using the mouse with your left hand incorrect i don't know like depends who you ask but technically like we're doing these things wrong or we could be doing them a different way but we were just taught to do them one way and never asked any questions about that and you could attribute that or relate that to so many different topics in tech um, that would be a great story to tell to an audience as soon as you get on the stage now i would follow a story like that in your case robson i would tell the story without even introducing myself first i would say like you know when I was a kid, when my dad was a kid and taught my mom, taught me, da, da, da. And then I would say, you know, my name is Robson and today I want to talk to you about, you know, disrupting things we believe in or something like that. And then you've got this cute story. You've got this intro. You have people, they kind of know what you're going to talk about. And you've kind of like help them focus or zero in on things, these things that we do without really questioning them and that feeling that we get from them and, 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 and how like that kind of applies to the rest of our lives. And so one of the huge things that I like to talk about is how to give introductions, how to open our talks um, in ways that are not necessarily directly related to our talks but are related to the way that, you know, this solution would help people or this pain point and how it makes people feel. So if you want to talk about something really frustrating, you could say, 
you know when you have to change your password on like a website and then you change you try to change the password and they or sorry you know when you forget your password you try your password they say it's the wrong password and then you try to change the password and it tells you you can't use the same password again you know like that whole frustration if you tell that a little better than i did then you remind people of like this really annoying thing that sometimes just kind of happens and you're like why is this happening to me when i need to log into my bank app or whatever and i might not be talking about passwords at all and i might not be talking about anything related to this but what i did was kind of bring to the surface this feeling of frustration and now i can talk about a frustration that's related to something else a frustration that's related to i don't know bad documentation or or you know bad CSS or something else that people experience that you want to talk about today. Do I have a volunteer for a third story? Really? Seven, oh, Daniel, thank you. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Hey can you hear me now? I'm not disappear. I hear you well, yes, thank you. I like all your plans. Thanks. Um, so I've been married almost 10 years now, and you, you get used to telling the story of uh, how you met your partner. So, so this is a story of, well, I'll, I'll get to how I met my wife at the end of it. Okay. Um, but my, my uh, let's see, we, my, my wife and I were both living in New York at the same time. We both went to college in New York. And in fact, we both went to college for music. I, she was going to school right up the street from me. Um, and actually, we had a lot of the same friends, uh, some of the people I went to school with. In fact, somebody that I, who was my, my roommate, his previous roommate was somebody that she knew. And we tracked it down, and we had been in uh, many of the same concerts together. And we must have crossed paths many, many times. Um, so I said, I'd tell you how I met my wife. We met online. Okay. That's the story. Oh. <laughs> In the end, you met online. <laughs> That's anyway. pretty good. Thanks. I all. like that. Thank you for sharing. Um, it's actually, I like that you said it like that. It's actually kind of like another tactic where you kind of build up the story and we think that it's going to go in one direction and you're like, actually, we met online. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty great. My husband's grandma and grandpa grew up next door to each other and only met when they both already left home and both of sat, like their parents were like kind of worried that they were still single and whatever and we're like, why don't you meet the girl next door? And that was after like 20 years of living next to each other. So it's pretty funny. Um, thank you all of you volunteers. We will have more opportunities for volunteering. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we get, how we start creating the story. So, you know, we've, we've sharpened our storytelling muscles a little bit in that we know, okay, I'm not approaching this with a series of facts. I want to open the audience. I want to connect to the audience by telling them maybe a little bit about myself, maybe a little bit about the topic, but I'm trying to do so in a way that's a little bit different. Now, what do I do with the actual content of my talk? Like, how do I start approaching this content? And like, what do I do with it? You know, if I know that I just solved a bug and with, a, with a solution and I wanna share that with the world. So one approach could be to, you know, get up there and say, today I wanna talk about solution X, Y, and Z. But you kind of like, want want like, you know, this is an art, this is, the magical sandwich we're making, you want to build it up, you want to like make it really exciting. And you want to really focus in on the problem that you're coming to solve. Because if people don't really know what you're trying to solve with your solution, then why would they want to listen at all? Why is this important to them? And for the first 50% of your talk or your presentation, what you want to do is really highlight the problem and tell people why they should listen without telling them why they should listen. You know, it's like the, the meme, like, tell me without telling me, right? So you want to, like, really give the entire story here of the problem and the pain points and what it might cause and, you know, what was there before and how 
that wasn't good for us before you even before you even like speak any word of the solution obviously everyone knows what the solution is going to be because it was probably in your in your talk title and you know in the thing at the conference so everyone knows what you're going to talk about but like in those first few minutes we're pretending that nobody knows and you are going to surprise them with this solution so i okay before i ask for a volunteer so i don't know if everyone's seen what I have in the repo, you've seen the story structure and the such. Before I get to the story structure, what I do when trying to tackle a, a topic is ask a bunch of questions. Before I can ask what the value is, I ask, well, who is my audience? Now, who, am I, who is my audience can be answered in two different ways. I can say like literally who is my audience, you know, a bunch of people from uh, New York City who are developers, or these are a bunch of junior, junior front-end developers, or maybe my audience is full of IT people or CTOs, I don't know, like literally who is in my, who is in my audience. But I can also ask, well, who is the audience that I would like to provide this value to? If I'm a front-end developer and I would like to speak about a new CSS solution, a new CSS feature that is incredible, that has changed my life, obviously the users of the websites are impacted by the CSS, but are they the person that I'm speaking to? Like, what can I tell them aside from, I'm sorry for the bad CSS we've given you all this time. Like, there is nothing I can really give to them if I'm speaking to the user. I also am probably not speaking to, you know, the head or, or the team lead or the CTO or like someone who's like way up high because they're not really involved in the intricate details of, you know, what the CSS looks like. So I'm looking to speak to the product manager. I'm looking to speak to the developer, right? To the front end developer who would be responsible for, for implementing something like this. So before I can know what that value I'm providing is, I need to say, okay, so who is that person? And one of my responsibilities while connecting with the audience is to tell the audience themselves who they are, which is where like characters is a huge tactic that you can use when presenting. So you say like you're on stage and you say you are a front end developer who works at a made up company. Today you got a new task. You have to build another page that does X, Y, and Z. Now you need to support that page in two different languages. And one of those languages is actually right to left. So what do you do? You create two CSS sheets because that's what we've been doing for years. But actually you don't have to do that. Now, before I get to the, but actually you don't have to do that. What I wanna do is, but if you have two different pages, what happens in a year from now when you leave the company to move on to another company and there's someone who takes your place, doesn't realize that there's another CSS page, makes only the change to this one CSS, and then the next time someone who needs a right to left language logs in, everything goes to hell, right? And you want to like build up this whole, here's the problem that we were facing all this time. And it is your responsibility, you and the audience, these front end developers that I'm talking to, it's your responsibility to make this a better place for, for these users. For these users who are not necessarily part of our, our conversation, but they are the people that we're doing this for. And the problem and the problem and the various solutions and then your solution and then how it works. So let's look at the story structure that I have in GitHub. Does everybody have access to it? It's at the top of the thing. Okay, let's look at it quickly together. So we have in the same repo, I have something called the story structure. If you've looked at it already, you see that I kind of explain it for you. So here's, this is, this is how I like to approach every single talk that I'm giving. I say, okay, what's my engaging opening? Now, I don't always have this from the get-go and it's okay to skip it for now. What I can't, what I do have is my story buildup. So I know what the pain point is and I know what I'm trying to solve and I know where this can affect people. I know where this can affect users. I know, for example, how this could lose me money or how can lose my customers money. I know where I might be uh, wasting time. I know where people might be suffering. You know, like all of the issues that I've just said, this is time to talk about all of the problems that we are facing in said problem. And then you offer possible solutions. 
Now, the reason you're doing this is for two reasons. One, because the solution that you eventually come to, maybe it's the one that you're presenting, might not be available or relevant to anyone. Maybe it's expensive. Maybe it requires a big team to implement. Maybe, you know, maybe it's just, it, it's like, just not possible right now. So you wanna provide other solutions. But the other reason is because you are going to have critics in your audience and they're gonna raise their hand at the, at the end and say, but why didn't you use this other thing? It worked for me. So if you can preempt them and be like, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that you should use this other solution. Well, that's a great solution and you can do it like this and like this, but it didn't work for us because you know our system was just too big or whatever intricacies that we had that made the solution not work for us. But if it works for you, great. This other thing, however, it did work for us. And so like all of these questions that might come up at the end, that's another thing you're thinking about, like who are the people who are asking me these questions and what are the questions that they might ask me and how can I preempt them? Then we get to the, the story peak and this is where you're like, and this is my solution. This is the thing that I've come here to tell you and we're at 50% of our talk. So we've already, we've talked about the problem. We've talked about how bad it is. We've talked about like all the things that can go wrong and we've talked about the other, the solutions for the problem. And then we're saying, and this is it. And the best part of this is whatever, whatever, whatever. And then our story breakdown. And this is where we demo, where we show code, where we talk about how you do it, how to implement it you know, all the good stuff, the stuff that you're saving for the end, because that's why they're here and you want to keep them here until the end. And then we've got the conclusion, the story close, and you always want to come back to the engaging beginning. Now, the engaging beginning is a hard part. And I have a little game <laughs> that might be hard to play with a bunch of people, but we're going to try. But before that, I want to show you... Uh, so I work at Vonage and we've got this incredible video platform like meetings platform that we we're not really allowed to use zoom in the company and it's got like a watch together feature so I guess I'll have to share my screen instead um, I'd like to show you a before and after recorded segment uh, that a colleague of mine did for a speech that he gave at at a javascript conference I have complete permission to use this and uh, the before was everything we spoke about not to do, and you'll see the after and the improvement that he made in that talk. And give me one second to be able to share my screen with you. Hi, I'm your. Ooh. Sorry about that. Bear with me for one second. Okay. Oh, man. Thumbs up if you can see my screen. Thank you. Can't hear it, though. It isn't. You're not showing the audio. Usually at the top, there's like a option to share computer sounds <clears throat> when you're sharing your screen. I'm sorry, were you, hold on. Am I having technical issues? You are, yes. One sec. Were you able to sit to hear and see? We weren't able to hear it. It's almost, it did say that you were sharing your computer sound. You guys, just give me a second. Mm -hmm. So you didn't hear my sound because I did click that. One sec. Okay, you know what, forget it. We're not doing it. We'll come back to it. I don't wanna waste our time right now. So what I would like is a volunteer, and I'll tell you what I'm looking for. I would like to hear about potentially a bug that you recently solved or 
an issue that you recently solved um, in your company or in your own personal thing that you know you might be able to share with an audience that you would potentially teach an audience or share at a technical meetup. You know, it could be something small because we're going to do it for a very few minutes right now. Uh, anything that you worked on recently that you don't mind sharing with the audience, it would be really cool. And you could tell me about it in one sentence and I'll ask you some questions about it. Angelita, is that how you pronounce that? Yes. Um, that's ah, right. Amazing. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Um, so recently, um, we've been dealing with bug fixes. Um, we have these people on HackerOne that try to break our site. And so we just do the tasks that they find. And um, there was a cross scripting problem. So they inserted some script tags into a field. And whenever we would show it, it would pop up a box and say, this is your cookie. And we've got your cookie, blah, blah, blah. And so um, really the only way to um, make sure that they couldn't just like attack everything is to just put like a HTML escape or the sanitize method in your HTML so that when it renders it, it won't be showing the script tags um, as like read like reading the script tags, it would just display the script tags. So it still kind of looked kind of janky, but it wouldn't be able to take over um, your user's domain cookie and stuff like that. So where exactly is the pain point in that for the user? Um, if another user had um, made a form, because um, basically they make forms that other users, that their sub users would go towards. Um, if somebody had made like a form and in the input, say for like the title form, like for the title of the form, they put like the script tag in there and it steals whoever's information gets in there next, then that's where the Got issue it. would happen. Got it. So Okay, so very bad. That would be a very yeah. bad thing. And like, what would be the worst case? What would be the worst thing that can be stolen or um, messed with? I would like, you know, credit card information or like yeah. the person's stored data that they have in their session. So. Okay. Amazing. Um, credit card information, that'd be bad, right? <laughs> so and then what how tell me again how it was so you said it was still kind of janky how you fixed it but that was yeah. like the best thing you could come up with yeah so instead of it actually firing off and stealing javascript information and actually running the script to like grab stuff in the database it just displays it um mm. so it would just look like normal text on the form so instead their form would just say the form title would just say script tag blah 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 stealing your cookie instead of actually doing it it would just say it got it Got it. Got it. Um, so in a situation, so then you're saying like a bunch of people probably face this kind of um, vulnerability, I guess, vulnerability in m most of their sites or anytime that there's a form related or something like that. Mm -hmm. And pro most probably they kind of know how to deal with this. But if you're talking, let's say to an audience that doesn't, you would want to remind them of this potential vulnerability and what they can do to make sure that it doesn't affect their users, correct? Yeah. So you'd want to open with some sort of like, I don't know, I like to be really creative and exaggerative in these situations. So, you know, you have a user visits your site, the next, the following week, they discover a bunch of charges on their credit card. And you can like get really creative, you know, charge for a new TV and a flight to Australia. And I don't know, tell me a bunch of other expensive things you could charge to your card. A new car, maybe? A new car. car. Could you buy a car with a credit card? That's I don't know, maybe. Um, computer? <laughs> no. Computer? Derek is saying no. Lots of MacBooks, lots of <laughs> MacBook Pros. <laughs> That's what I would do. Maybe one of those neat iPads with a pen. I've always wanted to color on one of those. Yeah. Um, you know, and your customer doesn't realize that it's a problem coming from you until someone else, uh, one of their friends uses your, your platform or your form or whatever it is as well. And the same thing happens to them and they compare notes and suddenly they realize that it's you and you're the problem. And they're telling all of their friends and all, you know, posting a bunch of reviews everywhere, telling people not to use your platform because you are clearly causing a big issue in their lives. So you're speaking to the audience of, you don't want this thing to happen to you because you don't want a bunch of people to hate your platform 
and to write bad things about you and to tell all of your friend, all of their friends not to, you know, use your service. Why is this happening? And here's like the why and you start building up the problem and you show you can show exactly like what it looks like this vulnerability and what it looks like when someone tries to steal your cookies and and then you talk about like the possible ways that you could solve this problem and prevent this kind of attack and maybe there are different things that you thought of along the way in in this journey of trying to solve this problem and you say but what worked for us is you know this thing that you just told us and we think this is the best and it doesn't look but maybe you know someone in the audience you have a better solution um and you know this is the best way that we found to do xyz and what this means is that while it might look a little clinky, at least your customer's data is still secure and there aren't horrible things happening to your users. Yeah. And that's your two minute pitch. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> that sounds good to you. So I would love for us to practice doing something similar. And I am going to give you a few minutes um, to kind of sit by yourself. Uh, if you want, we can break out into rooms. If that's easier for you, I'd love to hear your input on that. And to see if you can use the story structure to write up like a two, three minute talk um, to speak about something that you're working on, something that you solved, something that you're passionate about. You know what? It could even be like um, a startup pitch or a product pitch or a company pitch. You know, think about who your audience is. If my audience is a bunch of VCs, then what I want to talk about is where this problem exists in the world and how the solution doesn't exist and I'm going to provide the solution. And if the solution does exist, then how am I providing a better solution? That's your job if you're pitching the company. So I'm going to give you three minutes. Is that, tell me if that's enough. I don't know how many of you are actually going to actively do this and I don't want to waste too much time. But I would love to take a few minutes to try and like draft up something using I'm going to actually send you the story structure in a doc that you can duplicate and you can you can duplicate I'm putting this in here, you can duplicate this and write on top of it, if that's easier for you. And it's got also a line of questioning that will help you like you can answer those questions for yourself just to help you kind of get going in terms of who your audience is like what you saw what the problem was. And then we'll have a couple of volunteers who will speak for two, three minutes and we'll try to give them feedback. I usually do this entire thing in three segments. So <laughs> I'm kind of squishing it all into one. I will share the before and after of Yonatan's video. I'm sorry about that little up before, I think it's because I'm using an actual external mic, which is different than, so this is the before, and this is the after. And you can watch that and see, just watch until he gets to the code and you'll see the difference between the introduction and how he actually focuses on one individual in the second version and that person who needs to make a difference in their code. And I'd love to hear in the comments what differences you saw, except for the fact that he learned how to say the word geek. You'll see what I mean.
for those of you who don't want to share in audio video but you do want to get some feedback feel free to drop your doc and i'll be happy to comment on it or your peers will be happy to comment or you could just put it in plain text in if it's not too long inside the chat we can comment on that as well um a question could you elaborate on what you mean by what was there before yeah so if you know if you have just redone like i don't know your microservice infrastructure and you know beforehand it looked completely different so you want to talk about the journey from where you were and why you changed it and like what issues came with the way that it was before it's just another way of saying why did you do this like you had a situation a it was causing deployment problems it was causing i don't know website problems for users it was causing people to leave and now you have situation b which is better for all of these reasons. So it's really just a way of saying like, why did you change this? Or why did you fix this? Does that make sense? Good. Would you like to see an example talk of mine? Or do you want to keep focusing on this right now? I see a thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Is it possible to kind of do both where you tell us roughly how long the example talk will run and those of us who don't want to see it mute for I was, five minutes? I was going to just post it. Clearly oh. my screen sharing isn't doing very well. I was gonna post it and tell you which parts to look at. So I'm gonna post it anyway. And you can decide what to do with it. Intro. So I've sent a talk that uses this structure very well. Um, this is my the second talk I gave at Nordic APIs after I begged them to come back after I messed up Austin. And I essentially was talking about, again, how to auto-generate client libraries. Um, for the intro, I came up with a character named Jeff. So you could see that until minute 07, 1 minute 07. And then I talk about the problem for a while and get to the real crux of the problem at 744. And then the best part of the solution at 1308. So feel free, feel free to look at it after just if you need a little bit more inspiration. Oops. 
Yeah, and thank you for the feedback on Yonatan's talk. Definitely. I'd love to hear what else you saw in Yonatan's talk. And we will try to start our mini presentations in three minutes. Can I get a thumbs up for people who feel that they're close to finished? Amazing. How many kilometers do you do a day, Ariel, or miles? I don't know where you are. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm in Israel also, so yeah, I'm, I'm about as tired as you are probably. <laughs> um, I didn't hear the beginning. I'm not in Israel. <laughs> oh really? When I'm, I'm on my honeymoon right now. Oh. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm in Colombia. When I made when I agreed to give this workshop, I didn't have plans to be here and then I was like okay so we'll work for our first week and tomorrow we're officially taking vacation and going to a remote island so this is my last day of work so I appreciate you all sharing it with me <laughs> but what you didn't I, I still didn't hear how many kilometers that is um it really depends on the day to be honest um on a good day it might be I don't know five kilometers or so on a not so great day almost nothing it just depends on how i'm feeling and how my schedule works out and how much i want to walk during meetings yeah cool <laughs> that's awesome um okay do i have a first volunteer for a three to four minute presentation yes i knew you would thank you ross so um I hate cutting people off, but I will cut you off if you go too long. So just know that. And I apologize in advance because I really hate doing it. Um, let's quickly talk about feedback. So what we're going to say, we're going to talk about feedback that's kind of related to the things we talked about. So, you know, you know, and was like the opening engaging? Did it pull me in? Did I know at the beginning what this talk was going to give me? Um, you know, did I feel that it gave me, that it explained to me the problem that Ross was presenting a solution to? And did I know that Ross was finished talking at the end? Ross, a reminder, never to finish our talk with that's it or okay, that's all, you know, because when we say something like that, we kind of just like want want our entire talk. So I always want to finish with like kind of an inspiring sentence that brings us back to the beginning and lets the audience know that we're finished talking and you are up. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, hi, everybody. Um, imagine you're on a team that has just been tasked with making a small adjustment to the functionality in your learning platform that will now let people 
uh, reassign content that was already assigned. It was something that you couldn't do before. Um, and that means a lot of, uh, to a lot of people. And it's such a simple change. Um, it seemed like a natural thing for us to take on. However, as you and your team dig in and start to make this, this change, you start to realize this was going to be anything but simple. You start to dig into the code and you go class after class, still digging for the information on how it works now so that you can even figure out where to start. And uh, after going through many classes and being in several test files, you, you still are not clear. You have large charts of how this thing works, you think, but you still aren't sure. Um, you've got those several files, you've got tests now that have lots of setup. Um, it's overwhelming to change anything. Um, so you, you thought at the, the, when you started building your app that having services in, in your app would help you simplify. And so you tried to do that, but you started to realize that having a single method that was called to trigger this functionality was starting to limit your ability to represent concepts in a way that made sense when you looked at them. And it made you write your code in a manner that ended up being very procedural. It told you to do one thing, then another, then another. And you had to hold this all in your head at the same time in order to understand what was going on at any given time. And to make matters worse, this was now spread across many different places. So you had to visit many different parts of your application to piece together the story of what was going on. Um, you, you and your team started to realize that you, you had found yourself in a situation you didn't want to be in. You wanted tests that were simple to write. You wanted to be able to look at any part of your system and have it be clear what was going on and, and then how to change it because everything is always changing. Um, that's when you started to realize that one of the things that was limiting you was you weren't taking full advantage of, of the communication that you could have between different objects and the way you could model objects using just plain old Ruby classes, the things, uh, some things that um, are provided to us almost um, ubiquitous, but we just had overlooked the simplest, simple power of a, a Ruby object. Um, and so today I uh, want, want to talk to you about um, what I've heard referred to as message oriented programming um, is sort of the spirit of object oriented programming. I, and that's that in our system, we want to represent all these different concepts um, as little standalone systems that talk to each other. And so um, they send messages back and forth. These messages are what we call methods on plain Ruby objects, and they can be really powerful. Uh, these are the ways that we signal to all the different systems or Ruby objects, what we want them to do or what has just happened and that we want them to respond to. Uh, a couple different kinds of, of methods that we can look at are command and query methods. So these are two different types of things we can tell an object to do. We can either tell it to do something, command it to do something, or we can ask it something, and we that, that would be a query. Um, it's important for us to keep those two separate because it'll make it much easier to write tests, and our test step will be much uh, simpler. Another strength if you use uh, Ruby objects in this way is you'll be able to compose all these different tiny systems that can talk back and forth um, to make things that you never anticipated. There's a, a powerful concept in Ruby called duct typing, which means that a thing just needs to respond to certain messages um, in order to play a part in your system. And so someday down the, the road, when you, your system needs to change, you can simply pass in a different duck. So to close the circle, uh, <laughs> the, the, you and your team now, um, let's imagine an alternate universe where we had modeled our assignment system using um, these powerful concepts of plain Ruby objects, sending messages between each other, um, message-oriented programming. Now, when you go to make that simple change, it's just as easy as a simple introduction of a new object that plays this new role. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. I saw you speed talking there, but that was great. Thank you. <laughs> Take a breath. So for I didn't realize that Daniel had brought his baby into the frame and I thought everyone was calling you baby and I was really confused if there was like, you know, a bunch of people know you as baby or something like in baby driver. I don't know. <laughs> it took me a second. But um <laughs> that was great. Sorry, that was that was unfair of me. I'm sorry to distract. <laughs> I wasn't looking at that side of the screen, so <laughs> it's okay. Now it all makes sense to me. Um, 
Amazing. Exactly. You brought us to a dark place and then showed us the light. Exactly. I was just going to say you filled us with anxiety and that's what you want to do to your audience. I know you should always like, you know, take them to the light place. Don't just give them anxiety. Um, the more anxiety and stress you give to your audience, the more you build up that suspense and that like, oh man, this hurts and I'm familiar with the situation and like, what's going to happen next? Especially when you put them in that team, like you said, you're on this team and you know what? Ditch the word imagine, ditch the word on imagine, you know, like you don't even want, you're, you're telling them they're, they're in that team. You're like, you're on the team that's tasked with the, you know, with the task of, <laughs> of charged with the task of adding this, of changing this feature, you know, and, and you're really putting them in that, in those shoes. And then you've, you know, you've got all this mess and you felt you understood and you're digging and you're digging and you, you, you're lost in this whole system. And like, you really want them in that place because you want to then show them the light. So that was incredible. You also don't have to, you can, you don't have to like uh, explicitly say to close the circle. You can finish by saying like, now imagine an alternate universe or now imagine this alternate universe where you are using um, other methods to go about this and how that could look different for you and your team. So bravo, thank you. I appreciated that. Does anybody have any other feedback? Hmm. Sounds like some people would sign up to watch your talk, Ross. <laughs> so start prepping it. Does, do I have another volunteer? Now that you've kicked us off. Yes, yes, Russell, go ahead. Thank you. So uh, back in 2012, uh, I saw the British TV series Sherlock. Uh, and one of the recurring themes of that show is Sherlock goes into his memory palace, which is a fictitious place in Sherlock's mind that he goes to and he closes his eyes. And he, he does that in order to think about problems or to remember things or whatever. Uh, and it turns out that that's a real thing. It's called uh, the method of Loki, and it's, it uses our geospatial memory, the, the same thing that we use to remember how to get to the food store or, or what have you. Uh, and it, it overlaps that for any other kind of memory. Uh, and it's the same technique that people who remember pi to the umpteenth place, you know, they use that same technique to remember you know, all those positions of pi or whatever. Um, so I wanted to do that. I thought that was really cool. It seemed like a very powerful thing for, for one's brain and thought and cognition. Um, but there's really nothing really kind of out there that did that from like a computer standpoint, right? Um, there, one popular approach is that you would maybe have like a 3D space, like say Minecraft or something like that. You have a little stove over here that represents one thing and a vase over here that represents one thing. And that maybe that works for some people, but that doesn't really work for me. I'm, I'm more like I need a literal content to be interacting with in 3D space. And so I, for me, I wanted web browsers. I wanted to be able to have a web browser in a 3D space and go into a room and have a web browser there or many web browsers really um, and have content there and, and images and video and things like that and have it all contextual and to be able to use that when I'm not at my computer kind of remember it's like oh yeah I go through that room and then through that room or whatever and it's uh, I'm looking at that screen and that's where that particular piece of information is. Um, so for the past several years I've been trying to pick up this problem trying to do it in Rails was my first thing obviously uh, and then in Minecraft and then trying to do it with CSS and then JavaScript game engines nothing really worked, like nothing could really do what I wanted it to do as far as like rendering a web browser in a 3D space. So I really just thought that this, this project was impossible. Um, but last year, we were gifted with the pandemic, which is both frustrating, but also offers some fruits, uh, which for me rendered itself as some time to explore other things. So I started picking up full blown game development, and I found a way to render web browsers in 3D space. Uh, and now I'm building a game to do this. It's a 3D database. Uh, it's a place to organize your thoughts and memories in, in different cells, kind of like Excel. And I'm going to be shipping this uh, a demo in a couple months. And it's uh, hard to believe that uh, at this point, more than eight years earlier, I was just having this idea. And now I'm at this point where I'm actually building it and then producing this, seeing this come to fruition. So that's my, my little story. Thank you. So that was a really cool like product demo. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, it was really cool. I felt that you had all of the parts in there. One thing that I was a little lost on was like, I wasn't entirely in with you on what the problem you're solving for me as the audience. Um, I got the Sherlock bit. I got the like forgetting to do things and then you lost me at browsers and 3D. So I, 
maybe there's something I missed, but maybe a little bit more explanation for the audience in terms of like the context and what, why, I guess, why they should listen. So yeah, I know you're, that's, I know that's you're speaking point. fast. And yeah, I was, I was just, you, you're throwing all, these good, 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 <laughs> all these good ideas at me. I'm like, okay, she's right. Totally got to put that in my story and whatever. And you're absolutely right. I, I know. I'm not, I'm not giving more. you a lot of time and a lot of prep time. So I, I know these aren't perfect, but always ask yourself, like, what am I giving the audience? And like, what do they know? What might they not know? You know, what, what context am I putting them in? So that was great, though. Thank you for putting yourself out there. Um, sounds like... Sounds like um, we, some people wanted to see Ross's sheet. So maybe you want to share what yours as well. I don't know. Um, I'd love another volunteer. Or somebody who wants to post their text in the group and we can comment on that if you're a little bit shy to present. But remember that we're always on your side here. A few things to remember about your audience while we're here and maybe one of you will feel like volunteering in a few minutes. The first one is that the audience is always on your side, assuming they're not jerks, right? You're there, you're the expert on the matter. They're probably not thinking about how weird you look or how weird you sound or you know whether you stuttered while saying a word. Um, most likely, the audience is thinking about themselves. If you're nervous, it's because you're thinking about yourself. And what you should be thinking about is the audience and how to provide value to them. So audience is thinking about like, what value can I get from this? You're thinking about what value could I give the audience? You're not thinking about, do I look weird? Does the audience think I'm weird? Does the audience not think I'm smart? Obviously, when we're beginner speakers, we're always worried that the audience doesn't think we're so smart. At the end, you realize that the audience is just a bunch of people like you and me, and we're kind of all stumbling our way through life and trying to teach people interesting things that we know, there's always going to be a person in the audience who benefits from what you have to say. So remember that. And it looks like I have some volunteers. Tell me if I'm pronouncing your name right. Sveta, Sveta? Very close. I'm Sveta. Hi. Sveta. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for volunteering. All right. Let's see how this goes. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, I'm at my desk and I see a Slack notification come up on a familiar channel called Dev Notifications. There's an error that I really don't know what it is. I just see that it's fired, missing incorrect access to an API we're working with. I open it up, it links to a honey badger, some worker that I haven't even really looked at. And I don't know, it happens a couple times. I resolve it and I move on. And maybe <laughs> in the past, I've even muted this channel and maybe you have to. Uh, I wanted to talk to y'all about exception handling and sometimes can be a little not fun to work on. And at Backerkit, we had a similar issue where we were both sometimes ignoring uh, exceptions that didn't seem to be important and then they were <laughs> and sometimes spending time on not getting an exception with a gnarly solution that somebody's PR is sitting there that you don't want to exactly review. Um, the problem that seemed to be coming up in exception land was really a misalignment in our collective relationship with exceptions. Um, so we decided kind of as a team that this is something we wanted to, to work on. Unfortunately, it took many iterations. Um, we started with kind of trying to make a process that would work for everybody. And in developing that process, we noticed how different our different processes were. Uh, you'd be pairing with somebody and just like have a very different perspective on how important something was or what the solution would be or what an appropriate time box was. And we have a meeting that we talk about dev issues and anytime there was a honey badger agenda item, like everybody would, you could just feel, even virtual land feel the room kind of tense up because we would be disagreeing and not feel like we were moving forward. Um, but we did land on a new process with the doc where we would triage the every new one. We'd have Badger Patrol. Um, and 
we thought we were tackling this and there'd be new stories in the ice box like okay we're making moves however we would take a look at like the main <laughs> errors in our app like if you see a graph and like actually we weren't moving the needle um and so we kind of doubled down back on this and we actually made a tool that is a dashboard um to display what exceptions we were seeing in real time and a very important thing to like actually get further in this problem is that we had to segment we have to segment what was going on um i think it just felt like this is annoying and this is a thing we don't we're disagreeing on but actually it's because we were trying to solve many problems at once i think we had different fluencies when you open up an exception like how able are you to track what's going on um, and that was just like a skill we needed to build up as a team there was just too many um, there's too many to get through in a day and i forgot what the psychological word for this is but there's like a paralysis if you feel like you can't make a dent on something you're like well i might as well just not do anything and the, the handoff was really hard. And so this dashboard that we made, made it easier to tick off what errors we had acknowledged. And also just taking a concerted look at these, like even though it was painful, us actually like not following our normal process where you might just like have a bug pair and not, there would be like a time box, actually like getting rid of the time box and digging into like our fluency and ability at actually tackling um, both like exceptions and also like what we do in different cases uh, ended up being really useful. And I think also having some sprints where that was our goal made it so that there weren't too many. Um, and so now BadgerBot is a tool that we use every day and uh, we have an easier time managing exceptions. Thank you. <laughs> Hooray for BadgerBot. Um, okay. So I felt that you gave us a bunch of all of the pieces and we got like the pain point. You had mentioned this tension felt anytime that like Badger issues would come up, right? That's how you said that. I would have that at the very beginning. You know, like you mentioned the dashboard and then you mentioned all of the reasons why it's important. All of that stuff should come before it because the problem with an audience um, is that it has an attention span of like, I don't know, two seconds, especially nowadays. And once you've presented the solution, people are like, they're like, okay, I got it. I can go home now, right? So what you wanna really do is build up all of the pain points, all of the issues. You know, sometimes we ignore things we shouldn't be ignoring and, um, you know, uh, turnover takes time and like passing information takes time and all of these issues and this is causing us pain and stress and we're actually paralyzed because we feel that we're not going to be able to tackle it all of these issues these are real things and you want to talk about them before you even present the dashboard and when you do present the dashboard you want it to be dramatic you want it to be like this is the best freaking thing we've ever done because we have had all of these issues and here is this awesome thing that we did and it was awesome for us and you could do the same thing. So you're always like, if you imagine your talk and like kind of, you know, this timeline, you've got like problem, 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 problem. Halfway through you start talking about the solution or maybe even other solutions and you're like, real solution is way past the 50% mark depending on how much time you have and like, you know, what you're actually talking about. But you want to like really exaggerate that anxiety that Ross gave us. Like you want to, that's what you're, that's what you're looking for. So I really like the intro because it puts us in a place that we're all familiar with. Like I said, I see this Slack notification. I kind of ignore it because why not? And I probably shouldn't have ignored that. And you could take that story and turn it into like, here's a horrible thing that could happen if you do ignore your Slack notification, um, but you wanna like, public speaking is a little bit like acting, okay? We're, you know, it's like the food thing. Like we can give the talk, we can give the information or we can give the information. And that's what storytelling is. So <laughs> thank you, I appreciated that a lot. Love it, thanks. Uh, I hope that helped. And Dane, last volunteer before we play a little game. All right, cool. Uh, so my uh, I'll let you go as well. <laughs> are you hearing me? 
So uh, my dad has a restaurant in uh, Jamaica. I don't know if you guys can see my background, but that's Jamaica. Um, and I would go on vacation like once or twice a year. And every time I'd go to the go on vacation, my dad has this old school POS system, um, point of sale system where you have to go in there. It's kind of like semi automatic. You punch in some codes and you can change the prices on the fly. Um, but it always takes like two hours of my time because I'd have to go in and relearn the API on how to change it on the actual device itself because I have a Mac, all the drivers are on PC, could never figure out how to do this thing efficiently. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm very lazy. And when I go on vacation, I don't want to take my time off to troubleshoot some stupid point of sale system for my dad. And he's extremely annoying because every single time I go to Jamaica, he has a new price that he either wants to adjust or he wants to add a new item. Um, so as any software engineer would do, I decided this is very annoying. I'm going to dedicate one year of my life into building an automated solution so I don't have to give you uh, two hours of my time every time I come to Jamaica. So what I ended up doing was I uh, rolled out a full uh, point of sale system for him um, using Rails as the back end and um, just a regular web view on an Android tablet. I got him a draw and kind of coded everything from scratch. And so now, like a few weeks ago, he called me and he wanted to update um, a price on something. And all I had to do was just log into a Rails backend and update the price. And that was that. All because I didn't want to do it whenever I go on vacation. So now when I go on vacation, I'm free of all of his nuances of, of trying to get me away from the beach to update some price on this point of sale system. Nice. As someone who's headed towards the beach, I appreciate the story. <laughs> As someone whose parents think that I am the computer fixer of the world, I'm sure all of your parents as well do. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I like that you, you know, this wasn't, um, this was different. You, first of all, really took us to a place that we're all familiar with, with your dad, um, kind of put us in this scenario and then said like, here is just a solution to a little problem that I had and how to automate it. And like, it's something we would all do. And it's some, probably something we never really thought about, but like, here's an easy way to automate something that comes up a lot. And I appreciate that a lot. So you had a very good introduction. You, it was uh, sentimental. It was your dad. You had this issue and the solution that you presented and a good close up. I really like that. Thank you, Dane. Thank you. Any other feedback? <laughs> um, Michael, my dad still calls me every time he needs iTunes help, even though I don't use iTunes anymore. So, cause back in the day I was always pretending I was on iTunes cause there was nothing else to do. <laughs> um, Daniel, I saw that you raised your hand before. I also have a quick game to play. So um, do you... I think I was clapping. I meant oh, to clap. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, cool. <laughs> Great. Awesome. So we're going to play a little game. This game is supposed to, it's a very, it's going to be really quick because we don't have much time. I asked them for three hours and got an hour and a half. I should have asked for five. Um, and it's going to just exercise our introduction brains, how like you can talk about something that isn't really related to the problem or solution just to get people in that space. Um, and I've set up a little, I'm posting this link here. I've set up a little like apples to apples space in this mural. You can join as a visitor. You don't have to put in your name. You can if you want. It'll put you in as a like octopus or... In my last session, I just had someone who actually joined as a visitor and then was trolling the entire time. Um, if you must, go for it, but... <laughs> Uh, but be nice to your friends. Anyway, what I'm going to do is like, there's nothing there yet. You don't see anything. I'm going to like uncover a card and we're going to pretend. So let's do this right now. So we're going to pretend that I just got on stage and I said the words 267. 
and you are to guess or give suggestions about what my talk might be about. So you can grab post-it notes from the sidebar on the left, um, put a post-it down and put and write what you think that uh, my talk could be about. And I'm going to give you a one minute timer and it's gonna make a little sound. So did everyone find the post-it notes? So what you're thinking is, if this was the intro to my talk, if this is how I was opening my talk, what could my talk possibly be about? You know, maybe I wanna talk about how many bugs are escaped a year or something to that extent, I don't know. Um, ready, set, go. <laughs> This is where I wish I can play background music. Some game show music. Oh, wow. I've never done this with so many people. <laughs> so when the timer stops, just move your mouse to the right or something so I can see over all the names. And if you were to write, ooh, and if you, here, I'll move that back, thank you. I'm gonna lock that. <laughs> you can kill the square. Let's kill the square. We don't need it. Um, think about like, if you're talking about, let's say you're saying like, what would the talk be about? And how would you lead into that talk? Okay, stop typing and move your mouses away so I can read these. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a number of minutes in a year. I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> Are we okay? This has been a very long workshop. Uh, 267 is ever the house I grew up in. Okay, what would your talk then be about? Day since the site went down. This could be, you know, production, testing, you know, being live, things to ensure that we could stay up, high availability, notifications on my phone, muting notifications. So I'm kind of want you to think about like, what kind of talk would this turn into? If you're talking about notifications on my phone, this is how many notifications I get per hour and it's ridiculous. What are the things we can do in order to have better, like, you know, away time from our phone or maybe teach people how to turn off all their notification settings? How many bugs must a developer fix in their career before they can call themselves a developer? You could make this a talk about gatekeeping. I don't know, I'm giving you ideas here. You're supposed to be giving me the ideas. How many times you said, I can't say bad words, this is recorded. <laughs> I think I say, oh snap, way more than 267 times per month, but sure, I'm, I'm, I'm glad things are going well for you. Days since on call was quiet. Again, this is another like tips on how to make sure that we can not have too many errors in production. Um, something to that effect. Hours it took to debug an issue, great. How many times you think this work isn't for me? I hope you're not thinking that because if you are, go find something else to do. This is why I stopped being a developer because I had my days like, this is nice and all, but like, this isn't my life passion. I like talking too much. Um, the amount of seconds someone takes to look at a PR comment and give an LGTM, giving more thoughtful feedback and reviews is important. Um, if you can write an entire talk about that, that would be great. Number of minutes in a year, we said that was wrong. Times Butler styled, I, do. I don't know what that means. You're welcome to, to explain it. <laughs> the number of flavors you can taste in a beer. We have some beer experts in this group, I guess. Uh, credit score, I hope not. <laughs> okay, I appreciate all of these suggestions. We're going to uncover another card. I have five more minutes and we're going to try to think if this could be, a, if this was the intro to a talk, what would my technical talk actually be about? So, you know, I've got one and I'm not going to uncover this one, but it's about being sprayed by a skunk. So how to detect bad smells in our code, things to that extent. Okay, so let's find another one. And I am, man, it's on Netflix per day. I guess that's an okay number of minutes if it's the weekend. <laughs> I'm going to delete all of these. I hope you're not emotionally attached to them. And we're going to uncover another card. Oh man. And we're going to try again. 
Let's see what I like here. Okay, here's one. And this is a true story. This actually happens to me constantly. And every time I'm in a rush. Now, if you were to talk about that pain of getting locked out of your house and how frustrating it is and, you know, all the moments that you say, like, how did I let this happen? And like, I should have taken my key this morning or I shouldn't have lost my key or whatever it is. What if you can take that feeling and, and bottle it and present it to your audience, what other kind of frustrations could you relate them to in your technical talk? Ready, set, go. <laughs> you right upside down. Oh, you just turned the card over. <laughs> Smart passwords, forgetting your password. Very good. Very good, people. Take it a little further than smart passwords. Can you give a 20 minute talk about smart passwords? Mm. The importance of making it safe to fail on your team. So one time I actually got locked out and I was in a massive rush and I had to go get the key from a friend who had it like, I don't know, like a 10 minute drive away and like, whoops. And that was my first little motorbike accident because I was driving like a psychopath. So if you do get locked out, just chill out. Everything's okay. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. 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 Move your mouses over so I could see. All right, finish typing, finish typing, finish typing. I'm supposed to let you go in two minutes, so we have to wrap this up. Okay, let's read these quickly before I say my final words. Okay, <laughs> balancing security with usability, important, malicious users. What about them? Tell me more. Tell me more about the malicious users. Getting stuck in thought loops, like the one where you're standing on stage and you think that you look dumb because you said that thing dumb, yeah. <laughs> Um, how you can get out of those thought loops. Um, my husband and I have a code where I say I'm getting stuck in a loop and then he helps me get out of the loop. And it's very nice because I just say loop and then he's like, okay, everything's okay. You're fine. We're having a great time. It's very nice. Um, how to be a developer that doesn't have to remember things. I like that. I like that because we don't always remember things. We Google half the things. We save half the things. How many of you have like a clipboard saver where you save a bunch of things right why you should still use a, why you should use a password manager agreed coding without internet on a train or a plane that's actually a good lesson to how to prepare your computer so that you can use it without internet using some kind of proximity password instead of using an actual password all these things are good magic locking links for people like me who forget everything yeah i get it i feel it the importance of making it safe to fail on your team here's how good i'm glad you're thinking in your talk brain, like how to turn this into a talk. Coding without internet, again, um, oh, did we read this one already? Yeah. How to be a developer that doesn't have to remember things. We said that, how you should implement password lists. So we're seeing a lot of password stuff. What I remind or remind you, alternative ways to log into a website. Yes. What I want to remind you is that we always want to provide value, right? So we're going to recap here. We've got the engagement piece. We've got value. We always want to pull our audience in with a story. We want to connect to them. We want to let them know who we are without giving them facts about who we are. And then we always want to think about the audience and what they want to learn. And remember that they're only thinking about themselves, that they have a teeny tiny attention span. And we want to build it up so much that they're on the edge of their seats waiting to hear what we have to say. It always is great to take concepts that people connect to. Talk about our parents. We all relate to our parents. Talk about pain points. Talk about anxiety. Talk about stressful situations at work. You know, talk about ways that we're wasting time, ways that we're wasting money, silly experiences that happened to us, journeys we went on in order to figure something out, mistakes we made. People love hearing about our mistakes and how we solve them because everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> so what I saw you looking up. And always remember that it's kind of like acting and we are making a delicious sandwich. So every time you approach a talk and you wanna give a presentation to an audience, you say, how am I going to make them a delicious sandwich if they're not gluten-free? How am I going to add flavors and you know put a nice crunchy crust on either side? 
like the beginning and the end and put everything together real nice and things with flow and and you know nice transitions between one section to another ask a lot of questions to your audience because you constantly need to pull them back in and i'm going to post in the chat my like one of my favorite videos on the internet which is a great example of how to take um, a really relatable uh, game jenga to describe a very highly technical concept if you've seen um i'm blanking on the movie <laughs> uh what is it called the big short there we go if you've seen the big short you remember this scene that i'm posting right now uh, it's great watch it be inspired by it channel your inner ryan gosling um thank you <laughs> thank you all for joining me um i'll post my twitter as well feel free to message me i'm gonna look at if anyone wrote um Put down it put their their sheets down i'm going to check those out right now feel free to message me if you ever want to send your talk concept abstract to me feel free i'm happy to look at these things i hope this was useful and i hope you enjoyed thank you so much Bye, thanks everyone. so much this was dope yeah. great thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thanks so much Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye to all of the treadmill walking people. <laughs>